So, next topic is polymer. Um, Soma uh, will talk us through what um, polymer is and why he thinks that this is making sense uh, uh, and makes the web a better place. So, um, without further ado, Soma, is your microphone working? I hope so. Yes, sounds okay. like it. So, give it up for Soma. <sighs> All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for actually wanting to see this. This is more than I expected. That's nice. Um, okay, so Polymer. Um, what is it? I'm actually starting with what Polymer is because uh, in my experience there's been a lot of um, half knowledge been floating around in the web which says like Polymer is just like polyfills and it's going to go away anyway and it's a huge library, don't use it, stuff like that. And that's probably because the, the word Polymer has many contexts inside of the Polymer project. So the Polymer project which is initiated, hang on a second, I clicked on the wrong side of my screen, like this, um, is structured like this. So these are a bunch of up-and-coming web technologies. So this is things that browsers are going to implement or partially even have by now. Platform.js is a collection of polyfills that fills in these functionalities if the browser doesn't have them. And on top of Platform.js, there is Polymer.js, which is a framework using these web technologies to make web development easier. And the layer Polymer.js is actually pretty lightweight. So if people say Polymer is a huge framework, it's not. It is huge, but because there's a lot of polyfills in there. The framework itself is rather small, and the more browsers have technology themselves, the smaller the library gets. So uh, keep it in mind. So that's to make it clear, Platform.js is a collection of polyfills, Polymer is a lightweight framework, and the Polymer project is a Google project with, which develops Platform.js and Polymer on top of Platform.js. I think I'm phasing in and out here. Um, so what, what, what's the goal here? The goal basically is that you have your own tags inside your, your project which makes structuring much more easy. So just imagine, if you've ever worked with Bootstrap, which I assume everybody here on the web track has, um, just imagine that you can use the Twitter navigation bar like this, instead of like four divs inside a nav, inside a UL ID, a tag, something, I don't know. Um, talking about the semantic web, this is much more semantic than what Twitter Bootstrap is doing. Um, and also like, I for just for, demonstration purposes, I wrote a spoiler tag, which is like omnipresent in every forum or on Reddit or whatever, uh, which when you hover over it says, oh my god, there's a spoiler, do you really want to read it? And when you click it, you actually see what's inside the text. Now the interesting thing is, if I, oh, ah, if I open this thing up and look in the inspector, there's actually just a spoiler tag with the text that is the spoiler inside. So where does it even say that there's, where, where does this text come from? And why isn't it in the DOM? I'm going to get to that later. But uh, that's the interesting part, basically. Uh, yes. So this is the goal. This is why you would want to use um, Polymer. And actually what they say, everything should be an element, even like, the connection to the API should be an element in the DOM and other elements reference this DOM element to get access to the API or to the uh, server connection or anything like that. Uh, let's come to the process, how you would develop an element, your own custom element. So the first what you're going to do is you define your scaffolding. This involves what what is the DOM going to look like, where are variables going to be placed, like, like templating into the text then you will want to have a controlled way to apply content and styles to the whole thing. I'm doing it wrong again, I'm sorry. Um, content and styles, so where, does, where is content being injected and where are the styles? You want to react to, uh, life, to, to changes with lifecycle callbacks, so you want to know 
when your new element is being created, when it's appended to the DOM, when it's leaving the DOM, when the mouse is hovering over it. Maybe you want to give your element an own JavaScript API so other elements can actually use it in a more complex way. And then you want to package it up and make it reusable for yourself and for other potential users or developers. So that was basically the theory. Let's get to the browser technologies. So not Polymer, but Platform.js. What are these browser technologies that Polymer is using? The first is going to solve the problem of define your scaffolding. Basically, what you're going to have now is the template tag. And the template tag is, I'll never learn. Oh, hang on. Now I get it. Sorry. I will have to practice this in the future, I guess. There we go. So um, the template tag is interesting because it makes something possible that up until now has not. It lets you define a partial DOM tree, which will be parsed, but not be rendered or executed. So as you can see here, I actually defined this template, which has a P tag, which has some text, and a script tag, which has an alert in it. This alert will never ever be executed until I actually create an instance of the template and I attach it to the DOM. So what I'm doing down here is I query my template tag, I basically, I get the template object, and every template object has this content member. This is basically the raw re parsed but not rendered DOM tree. And then I clone it, and the clone node true means I wanted to make a deep clone, everything that's in there, and then I attach it to the DOM. And at that point, that's the first time that the alert will appear on screen. And the same goes for uh, script references, style references, any kind of JavaScript execution, nothing will happen. You can have empty image tags, you can have unfinished DOM constellations. The browser doesn't really care. It will just parse the DOM tree. It will not execute anything. So it's kind of a safe thing. HTML templates are actually kind of usable by now, like in modern browsers, as they say. But um, yet again, it's, I mean, even those 44% is pretty, um, Optimistic, I'd say. Part two of define your scaffolding, and this is probably the most interesting part when it comes to Polymer, is the Shadow DOM. Shadow DOM is basically, or gives you the ability to create partial DOM trees which are totally scoped and isolated. What that means is, let me open up, where's the mouse there? Let me open up this link as well. This is the typical uh, video element tag. And if we look in the tree, again, it's just a video element tag with a video that doesn't even exist. So where do these buttons come from? We say, okay, yeah, it's a browser. But what's actually behind it, it's mainly, this is another diff. It has like four different diffs inside of it for the play button, the range slider, the number, and the mute thingy. And so what you kind of guess is, so browsers can actually somehow hide DOM trees underneath the video tag without me being able to access or style them. And this is what has changed now because uh, from, I don't know, a few months ago, you can actually enable show shadow DOM in the inspector. And now you can suddenly open up the video tag and look in the document fragment and see it's actually a div with a div with a diff, a few input elements, a number diff, and the range slider and everything. And the input element itself, it's again, has a shadow DOM inside, and in this case, it's just an empty string. But, um, so browsers have been using the shadow DOM for, I guess, forever. But now you finally have the opportunity to use it yourself. You can define tags, you can put content in there, and it's totally scoped. Other J JavaScript fragments, unless the ones written by yourself, can't access the DOM. Other CSS fragments can style it. And the styles you define in there are not going to leak on the outside. So if in my element I say I want every H1 tag to be like this big and red, it's going to be valid inside my own DOM, uh, shadow DOM, not on the outside. So this has like a really clear separation between user code and your own code. Um, and just th think about the synergy with templates, that you actually have a clear scoping 
of JavaScript and the variables and the global namespace that there is no leakage whatsoever. So you don't have to worry about if there is going to leak information in and override your globals or whatever. It cannot happen. So let's go a little bit. No, no. So how do you do that? So let's define a template. Uh, I'm going to define a template, and we're going to see something new here, which is the part attribute. So uh, I have a template, and I have a big uh, H1 and H2. The one is a title, the other one is a subtitle. And now what I'm doing is I'm getting myself the template. Uh, I get the host element, which is supposed to be the host of my new shadow DOM, and the template is what's supposed to be the shadow DOM. So I create a new shadow, uh, a shadow root on the host, and I append my template content to the shadow root. So now, whatever widget is, it's probably an empty diff, is now a shadow root host, and in the shadow root, the H1 and the H2 are going to be inside. That's how you do it in JavaScript. The part thing now is what actually can break the scoping, but controlled by you. So that's why I said controllably apply content and styles, because you can actually say, I want the user to be able to style this, even though, even though it is in my shadow uh, DOM. So once you give certain uh, shadow root elements a part attribute, you can, in your CSS, use the part selector to apply styles to it. So you have a very controlled environment where information can flow from the outside to the inside. And the same is actually for whole DOM trees. You can actually make whole DOM trees flow from the outside to the inside of your element. You can place a content tag inside your shadow root or your shadow DOM, and everything that is wrapped or is contained by the host element will be moved to there. So in this case, this is my, going to be my shadow DOM, this is my host element, so this text will actually be removed from here and will be moved inside the shadow root, uh, shadow DOM bet in between the content tags. And if you want to go even farther, you actually can uh, split up the content and move parts to different places in your shadow DOM. So in this case, you can use the content select attribute to say, I want the thing with the class title to go in here and the rest in here. And so this gives you a very, uh, very controlled environment to not only make styles open to the user, but also the content without writing elaborate JavaScript. This is all, as I said, browser technology. Browsers do this for you, not a framework. So it's all pretty performant and really fast and safe. The, the environment on the usability is even more uh, sad in this place. As I said, it's all pretty new. But again, we don't have to worry about it because Platform.js will help us out here. The next step, as I said, is um, defining an API. You define an API, an object. Oh, first, you actually have to, now you're going to register your, our own element and want to give that element an API. So let's start from the bottom. This is how we define a new element for the browser so that it doesn't just ignore it, but actually knows that th certain behavior is associated with that object. Um, every custom element has to have uh, a dash in the name. That's just a rule. I actually don't know exactly why, I guess, so to avoid clashes with uh, built-in elements. Um, and you can give the whole thing a prototype. So whenever someone writes now spoiler dash tag in, uh, in the HTML document, this constructor will be called. And the constructor up there basically um, just creates a new HTML element. It's nothing more. And now we can actually use callbacks to react to an element being created, an element being attached to the DOM. And now what we do here, basically, we just create our shadow root and Above here, we got a template, and we use it as our shadow DOM. And this would be the whole process of creating your own custom element. You can define your own functions here. Like if I said, spoiler prototype would be a do an alert function thing. Now every uh, spoiler tag would have a do an alert function on it, and you could call it. Um, 
that's how you do your own elements. There are a few more callbacks, so you can react to an ob object being created, uh, an object being attached to the DOM, being removed from the DOM, and to every attribute being changed. So this way you can actually react to you ch the changes you do in the uh, inspection of the browser or other Java JavaScript fragments, changing your attributes, um, you will just get a callback and get the old value and the new value and the name of the changed attribute. Also something that is new that I haven't used that much, but it might be come in pretty handy, um, you can extend existing elements. So in this case, I'm actually registering a new tag called my button, but I'm saying it extends button. This means all the existing constructor and shadow DOM and whatever is attached to that old element, I'm gonna take it over, but I can modify it. So uh, I could um, create yet another callback for created. In this case, I already have the button element as we know it, and I could just add a big image to it or an on hover animation or whatever. So I can extend elements on the CSS side, on the API side, on the Shadow DOM side, so whatever, I can put things around it. Uh, the only difference is that you use it like this. You don't just say my button in the DOM, but you say you have to know the base element and say this button is my button. And then everything will work as before. Uh, this just is one of the um, usages which actually Polymer provides for you. There's like a library of typical of example elements. And the G analytics tags is one of them which the difference makes pretty clear has advantages. And now the last um, thing I want to talk about concerning the technologies is packaging. So one of the cool things is that we now have HTML5 imports. So um, you can package the whole thing up like this. You put your template on the top or you just put your template in there and you write your script and you register your element, just all the things, you, the small scripts that we had before. Put them in an HTML file and in your main or whatever, you just do an import. And just as it was back with, with JavaScript, once the parser has gotten beyond that point, the element will be available to you in the DOM tree. So just put all your imports in the hat and um, you can use your tag in the body already because it has been parsed and executed inside. And you can uh, start. The support for HTML import uh, is basically non-existent, except in Canary, behind the command line flag, so that doesn't really count anyways. Um, but yet again, the polyfills are going to up. So let's actually get to, to the fun part, to Polymer. No. Wait, are there any questions for all the technology right now? So because now I'm going to leave that behind and just use it. Yeah. In one of the examples you have the you select Yeah. And then select uh, equals uh, nothing. Yes. Um, is this when selecting the whole button or just the content that is not yet selected? Um, that is actually something I do not know. This is an example from the Polymer patch, so I assume it takes everything that has not been selected yet. But I'm not going, not take my word for it, just try it out yourself, because I'm not really, really sure. reject changes. I don't think browsers can. They just also just log away an error or, or something. So you, it, you just have the same functionality as normal elements. Okay. It's pretty common to just throw an exception or something. But if you get invalid stuff in there. More questions? OK. Then let's get to this part then. So as I said, Polymer includes Platform.js. Platform.js is actually a pretty huge library. Polymer is rather small. It's basically syntactic sugar. 
because what you just saw is maybe we have a free floating template element and a free floating script element and the one references the other to create a shadow DOM and we register with the browser and it's all just kind of like floating around and okay you can group it by files with the import um, but polymer makes a lot of stuff really really easy for you so uh, to give you a few examples this is what an element looks like in polymer you just say you want to register a polymer element with a name my elements you define your templates and you give it a script this is much shorter so um, this empty object would usually include the API and certain configuration of element. But we leave it empty because we don't need any special behavior. So now when you would use my element, it would basically just be replaced by this H2 with a text inside the shadow DOM. So again, and you would just see my element in the inspector, but you would actually see like a big heading because in the shadow DOM, this is what would be in there. But there would be no special behavior attached or anything. I think then the biggest thing Polymer does for you is templating. So you can do stuff like this. I create a new element called favColor and I give it an attribute color. That means that you can actually use the elements favColor and define in the HTML color equals blah blah blah. Just back with the just like when you use back in HTML for the font tag or something, font color is blah. Um, and now, what this this is actually just like Angular, it's a two-way binding. So I define a color member on the as the API on the HTML object, and wherever I have these handlebar style templating tags, the color is going to be inserted. But also, I use it here inside an input field. So the second the user starts typing inside the input field, this change is going to be broadcasted all across the bindings for that variable. So I start with orange, so the text, uh, the color of the color itself is going to be orange, but the second I change it to another valid HTML or another valid CSS color, like red or blue, it's going to change and the you can actually see real-time typing if I would actually run this right now, which I didn't prepare for some reason. Um, Something nice that Polymer does for you when you have an attribute like color, there is automatically a function called color changed. So like you don't have to like you don't have to have one big attribute change callback and do a switch because of which attribute actually changed. You can just define a callback per attribute and actually react to that, which makes it really easy. And um, oh, this is not good. Well. Okay, um, actually what you can also do is inside here, I actually sadly forgot one slide, which is sad, but um, all right. You can put fire events. So events is something that Polymer is really building up upon. So uh, not only do you attach to events of other objects, but you can also fire your own. So for example, in here I could fire an event called color changed and other elements on the outside could actually just add with the add event listener uh, call, could attach to that element, add to that event, and react to it appropriately. So that's, and that's basically how all the communication inside Polymer is supposed to be. You write really encapsulated, uh, loosely coupled elements, which don't really have any tight coupling to others of your uh, elements, and you make them interact by events. I know in Angular they say that's not how it's supposed to be, you should not use events, but in Polymer you actually should, because that's like the browser's way of communicating in between elements, it's pretty performant. Um, period. And now I hope you have some questions for me. Uh, regarding the platform.js file, um, how much is the performance loss uh, when you are using it on when you're using a polyfill that is not supported on that platform? For example, if I'm using something on uh, Safari which, which is not supported, so it should be emulated by Polymer. 
there is some benchmark and this I, bad I don't know about benchmark but you're you're definitely losing some features of course because just think about it that uh, a polyfill can obviously not emulate shadow dom appropriately it will shadow dom actually guarantees that other javascript fragments cannot access your shadow dom and manipulate it since you don't have the technology the polyfill will just put your shadow dom as actual dom in there and other js fragments could access it um, so that's the one thing you lose. Regarding performance, I don't have any numbers. Uh, I think I didn't say it at the beginning, but Polymer is like really, really young. Like every week there's almost a new release and it breaks the old release. And um, even though I'm using it productively, don't. Because you, it, it, it will be a pain and it, it's really hard to maintain. And even the standards are changing. Just right now they disabled Shadow DOM altogether because the browsers had not uh, implemented the new specs. So for a while, even in the Chrome Canary, I did use the polyfill, but now it's back on. Um, <coughs> I think it is way, way too early to talk about performance. They're just saying, um, especially in Canary, that, for example, the communication via events is good and does not hinder your performance at excelling at all. Thank you. Um, are there any best practices about um, the content of the um, polymer elements? Because when I have a polymer element and the um, search engine is crawling my page, it's, there's actually no content for them to, to, to parse? Well, that depends. As I said, you can put your content in the actual DOM tree and just put the scaffolding in the shadow DOM. So that was, it's like with the which I had at the very beginning in the spoiler tag. So the, the content is actually right here. Just the stuff like the warning that this is a spoiler, which you might not even want to have crawled by uh, your search engine, is being hidden inside the Shadow DOM. And also, I think by now, the, the only relevant uh, search engine actually parses and executes JavaScript, so you don't really have to worry about it. But I'm not an SEO expert, so, uh, and again, probably too early to talk about SEO. But if you're worried about that, just have a close eye on that you actually put your content in the HTML document and put all the scaffolding in the Shadow DOM and then use the content tags or selectors to, to put it where it actually belongs. More questions? Was anybody here yesterday at the Go workshop? That was written in Polymer, just so you know. Uh, yeah, I have actually two questions. So first is, is Polymer, or do I understand correctly that Polymer is successor of AngularJS? And the second thing is, uh, Angular uh, is right now fighting with a lot of components are written in jQuery and it's really breaking everything. How this thing will handle yeah, jQuery and you know, all these things? Um, so, <laughs> so regarding your qu first question, um, Angular and Polymer are totally orthogonal in a sense. So I have heard a lot of people say that they can't understand how Google can back both Angular and uh, Polymer when they're trying to do the same thing. They do not. Actually, Angular has said that they're going to use Polymer as an underlying technology for the directives, for example. So actually, Poly uh, Angular will probably at some point be on top of Polymer. Um, just to make development more easy because actually the some of these services and the two-way bindings are actually probably pretty useful inside your elements. So you can use Angular inside your custom elements if you wanted to. And that's kind of what, what I would say to, towards your second question. Um, there is no real black magic going on here. So I could not see a way in which, like for example, jQuery could interfere that hard with Polymer. But keep in mind that I'm saying that assuming that there is no polyfill involved, because the polyfill, of course, breaks certain behavior. If, if we had a browser, which 
which would implement all the specs right now, I, I couldn't see any way that you could not use jQuery or underscore or whatever inside your elements. But right now with the polyfill there might be certain constellations in which it might not work. But that's not my experience. I've been using Propagate events, so this is just uh, then end station. And this is the problem with uh, Angular. So, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I was just saying that the jQuery components, like some drop downs and these things, they are uh, not propagating events the next. So Angular can't re uh, get the event. So that's that's what I was um, thinking of. So I don't know jQuery elements or whatever, so I can't really talk about it, but. I guess what you would have to do is like write a thin wrapper around it to actually emit events. Um, but in that case, there's also like just a very small and more like proof of concept library by Polymer, which is the Polymer elements, where we have like, for example, an Ajax element. As I said, in Polymer, everything is supposed to be an element in the DOM, even your connection to the server. So here's an element to do um, Ajax calls and react to it in a certain way. You have animations, you have a cookie as a DOM element, you have a file as a DOM element, and then you also have Polymer UI elements which give you like a UI accordion, which is pretty cool because you can do a Polymer UI accordion and put a lot of Polymer UI collapsibles in there. And then if you try it out, and it actually loads, or not, there you go. Um, you have this, this behavior which Again, from from the viewpoint of the DOM, just looks really, really nice. You just have these collapsibles in there, and if you remember, like how it looks in jQuery UI, it's weird. So, um, for me personally, I've been enjoying this very, very much uh, because it just seems, and that's why the title was "Other Web Makes Make More Sense Now." Because in Angular, I always had had worries, in my, maybe that's not just my problem, but I always worry about services interfering with each other and the scopes being connected even though I don't want them to. And here you have a pretty simple but pretty clear uh, in instruction of how things are going to work. Every element is just by itself unless you give it an explicit API and explicit points, where you poke explicit points into the shell to make styles or content leak in. If you don't do that, it's going to be isolated. Um, yeah, so if you just want to look around here, there are a lot of things. There's like a breadcrumbs UI element. There is also a tab. So probably before you start using jQuery elements with Polymer, try using that, I guess, to, to avoid it. But um, I can't really answer your question if... if so... I don't think it will break everything. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, again, we take your word on that, of course. This is like, again, bleeding edge. So, here's another question. Very good. Uh, so, you said about the two way binding. Yeah. Uh, are there limitations to what? Certainly. Yes. I'm pretty sure there are. Uh, no. Um, so, one thing is that they actually do not allow arbitrary JavaScript inside the handlebars. They actually wrote an own subset parser for the expressions that are allowed inside the handlebars. So we, of course, can you can add one, you can access the fifth element of an array and stuff like that. But even there, for example, to access the fifth element, you would have to use dot five and not the square brackets in five because they just forgot. And I think two days ago, the pull request was merged that actually square brackets are supported. So um, there are limitations and they probably don't even know them themselves. So um, just try it out. But as for, for the normal stuff that you do, like the stuff you would do in a typical Angular app, there's also like, like the, there is something similar to the ng-repeat for templates but it's actually supported by the browser, so support, uh, browsers are going to implement the repeat directive. Um, everything that I wanted to do, I could do up until now. So I would say usable, but there are probably going to be limitations at some point. Uh, 
Uh, so you said um, everything should be a DOM element. So what means everything? And I think it wouldn't it make the page quite slow if everything's a DOM element? Why would it? I, no, the point, the point is um, that if you write everything as a DOM element, you actually have a uniform way of specifying APIs and elements. So you could actually, like, at some point, you could have a very big central polymer element registry, and you're looking for uh, the elements of to, to access the Amazon AWS API or something. Think of it that uh, there should n not be any free-floating JavaScript anymore. So what right now is JavaScript libraries, like there's these, you have modules and stuff to have cryptography, like, like your MD5 module and your, um, your promises module, all that should be like a DOM element so you can actually reference it either as a factory or as, a, as, as an instance. So uh, you have like a server connection, maybe your server connection is actually wrapped by a local cache connection, which actually just passes through all the commands, but also right into local cache to work offline. It makes everything uh, really obvious how the things interact with each other in a declarative way, which is something that Polymer stands for being declarative. So. Um, there's probably, you probably have to make a trade-off. It might not be feasible to be, to say, I put everything in the DOM no matter what, but you should try to do it, and if you say, that is way too complicated for the small thing I'm trying to achieve, then you of course can, you can still use free-floating JavaScript. It's still a browser, it just behaves just, behaves just like before. Um, it's just a new way of thinking about how to structure your code. Okay, got it. Do we have more questions? <coughs> no? So you d still didn't answer any, uh, every question. <laughs> um, what, is, what is the standard way to use uh, Polymer in, uh, with uh, a model view controller framework? Um, is there? You don't. You don't. I okay. guess. Um, so the thing is, for m me, Polymer has replaced like Backbone or Angular. So I never looked what? up. What? <laughs> I never looked at what the back practices would be. Um, and I don't see the, see the point. But people probably have talked about it, so uh, there's going to be something on the web. But right now I'm just importing the Polymer JS dire directly from their site, like hot linking, because it's hot. Uh, <laughs> and then I start working. So, um, I can't really answer that question, honestly. I don't know. Uh, just an answer. Um, I think Polymer is um, um, some some new way to think about what is a controller, In, instead of like not like we had it for for some years that a page is a controller, but a, a Polymer element could be one controller, and so that you have your controller for this one Polymer element. Well, you have the template at the view, and your API is your controller, kinda, but still a little bit differently. So you can look at it this way, probably. Let me see. I, to, to answer the question, how big the library actually is right now. Uh, so right now, Minify, it's 150K, but including the platform JS. I can't tell you right now how big the individual parts are. That's the important part. Yeah. So yeah, that's why people are saying, oh god, it's a huge library. But on the other hand, just remove one JPEG from your page and you got that out, so. <laughs> <laughs> but we need this hero element, you know? Marketing is really keen on it. The conversion, damn it. Any more questions I can answer or not? So then, thank you very much. And of course, you also get our very limited speaker uh, cuff. I know that's the reason why you gave the talk. Yeah. And so, yeah, then it's just me. And um, the next topic will be a RESTful development API design for, for the real world. Um, 
And I shouldn't go too, uh, too close to the speaker, sorry about that. Um, but first we will have a 15 minute break, so if you want to get something to drink uh, or get some fresh air, we always try to get some fresh air in here, but it's a bit difficult in this room. Um, yeah, we'll see each other back at three.